Hello folks, welcome back. Uh, today we're going to talk about using the double and a half angle formulas to find the measures of angles. So I am expecting that you watch the previous video 5.3.1 where we derived the double angle formulas and, do, and we did some work with identities. But now we're going to use those formulas in a little more of a, uh, I guess I'll say precise way to actually compute the measures of some different angles. So if these formulas are unfamiliar to you, go back and watch the previous video or take a, a read through your textbook. I'm kind of assuming you've spent a little bit of time working with these already. Um, now let's go ahead and, and jump into things. So this question says, find cosine of 2 times alpha if alpha is equal to this angle right here in this triangle. So what it does not say is find alpha or even find 2 alpha. Those are not things that we're going to actually end up doing in this problem. We are just going to be working on the angles themselves, uh, or just working with the triangle itself. What I know is that cosine of alpha is, uh, well, there's an identity for it, or cosine of 2 alpha. It's either one of three identities, cosine squared minus sine squared, uh, or 1 minus 2 cosine squared, or 2 cosine, or 1 minus 2 sine squared, or 2 cosine squared minus 1. Any of those three identities will work. I'll go ahead and write, I don't know, the first one, just because I feel like writing it. Uh, so that is going to be cosine squared alpha minus sine squared alpha. Okay. Well, so then it need, looks like what I need to find is cosine alpha and sine alpha. To find both of those, I need to know the hypotenuse of this triangle. How do I find it? Pythagorean theorem. 7 squared plus 24 squared square root. I happen to know that that's going to equal 25. You can check me if you want. So the cosine of alpha is going to be adjacent over hypotenuse. The sine of alpha is going to be opposite over hypotenuse. So by the identity above, I know that cosine of 2 times alpha, whatever that is, is going to be cosine of alpha squared minus sine of alpha squared which will equal, let me pause for a second, uh, 24 squared is 576, 25 squared is 625, 7 squared is 49. Subtract these off and you should get 527 over 625, which, if we check our handy dandy calculator, reduces not at all. Doesn't reduce at all. It's always good to check when you get a big fraction. So that's going to be equal to cosine of 2 alpha. And again, I want you to leave that as a, as a fraction. Don't give me some goofy decimal for this. Leave it as a fraction. The fraction is where everything came from. You're not finding alpha. You're not finding 2 alpha. You're not doing anything of that sort. All you're doing is um, using the identity based on the information that you know from the triangle. Okay, let's do another type of problem. So here they're not giving us a triangle, maybe we'll have to construct it. They said find sine of 2 theta and cosine of 2 theta. Okay, so sine of 2 theta, I know the identity is 2 sine theta, cosine theta. And for cosine of 2 theta, I know there's a bunch of choices. Um, last time I used cosine squared minus sine squared. This time I'm going to chose uh, 2 cosine squared theta minus 1. Why am I going to do that? I don't know. I feel like it's probably uh, pretty fun to subtract 1 from things. So I think that would be a nice easy thing to compute. But I could use any of the three. And I should get the same answer no matter which of those three I use because we've proven that those are equivalent. Okay. But before I can do anything with 2 theta, I need to worry about sine of theta or specifically theta. Theta, I've been told, is an angle that lies in quadrant 2. So let's start to draw some of that out. 
angles always start on the positive axis and open this way. So we'll say here's theta. Doesn't specify that I'm on the unit circle, and in fact, knowing that the sine of theta is 15 over 17 tells me that the opposite is 15, and the hypotenuse is 17. We can solve this backwards by doing the square root of 17 squared minus 15 squared. I happen to know ahead of time that that simplifies to 8, but I'm going to do one important thing on this 8. Because I'm in quadrant 2, when I label that out, I know that that 8 is really a negative 8. That's representing the coordinates. So from this, uh, I'm going to look, I'm going to now take a look at what I need. I'm trying to find sine of 2 theta, so I need to know 2 sine theta cosine theta. And I, it looks like I also need to know cosine uh, squared theta here. So I'm going to take my picture and write, uh, well, I know sine of theta. It's 15 over 17. Why? Because I was told that. I'm going to find cosine theta. That's going to be negative 8 over 17. Now, I'm prepared to solve for my two uh, objectives. So I'm going to write that sine of 2 theta is equal to 2 sine theta cosine theta. And that's equivalent to 2 times 15 over 17 times negative 8 over 17. Which, if I pause and look at my calculator, should equal something like negative 240 divided by 289. which, uh, again, just double-checking, does not reduce, so that would be equal to the sine of 2 theta. Let's compute cosine of 2 theta. Again, I could use any of the three cosine identities, but in this case, I'm going to use 2 cosine squared theta minus 1. Why? Because I want to. So that's going to be 2 times negative 8 over 17 quantity squared minus 1. Again, a little detour to my calculator. And that should give you 128 over 289 minus, so still subtracted by 1. Remember the negative 8 is being squared, so that becomes a positive 8. 289 minus 128 gives me 161. So this is going to be 161 over 289. Double check that, that uh, whether or not that reduces. Probably won't. Sure doesn't. So that's going to be my uh, fraction equivalent for the cosine of 2 theta, and that's how I find it. Um, I want to do a little quick check, by the way. Uh, this is something that is going to be really important when we do the half angle identities. If theta is in quadrant 2, then 2 times theta cannot also be in quadrant 2. Think about what quadrant 2 means. It means, in degrees, that theta is between 90 and 180, right? So if I'm going to take that angle and double it, the 2 theta has to be between 180 and 360. So it's going to be in quadrant uh, 3 or quadrant 4. Without actually computing the size of theta, I don't know which of those two quadrants it will lie in, but I do know that 2 theta is going to be in one of the bottom two quadrants. Um, and I wonder, then, maybe I could figure this out looking at the sines and cosines. I know the sine value came out negative. That makes perfect sense because quadrant 3 and quadrant 4 both have sine of x negative. I also know that cosine x came out positive, right? Positive 161. Where does that happen? Well, that happens in quadrant 1 or quadrant 4. So it actually seems like 2 theta, based on my result and what I, I know about where 2 theta would need to lie, that 2 theta should lie in quadrant 4 somewhere. Uh, now, do I necessarily need that information to solve the problem? No, but I think it's really helpful to have a nice a visual of what's going on. We had some angle theta. 
then the angle wrapped around, right? We doubled it. And I think my picture was not quite to scale, but we've doubled that angle. You know, it doesn't necessarily go reflected or mirrored because that, that depends on the size of the angle, but the angle to theta now is in an entirely new quadrant. So we're increasing angles as we go around the surface. In terms of using the double angle formula to find actual angles that are doubled, that's about it. It's, it's not much more complicated than that. Obviously, if you have to compute a tangent, um, the identity itself is a little trickier. I, I skipped it over for time. Um, but the actual procedure is the exact same. You just compute uh, the values you need from theta and plug them in and then simplify. Uh, most of the challenge here was actually just the numbers and the fractions. However, these double angle formulas are perhaps more, I don't want to say they're more useful, but they're more complicated when you choose to use them backwards. And here's what I mean by that. So I'm going to try this first one without an identity, and this is not how you'll solve these problems normally, but it's, it's here to illustrate the, the principle, to prove the, the concept, and then we'll prove some identities that can help us out. Say I wanted to compute sine of 22.5. I have no idea what that angle is. All that I know, though, is that if this is x, then 2 times x would equal 45 degrees. And I do know what the sine or cosine of 45 degrees is. So it feels like I ought to be able to do this. I ought to be able to somehow divide the angle in half. Now, a challenge is that I need to go back to my list of identities. Where is she? And find a list of identities that only has a sine x inside, because that's what I'm trying to compute is sine of 22.5. Most of these identities have a sine times a cosine, no good. Tangent, tangent, really no good. Even this one has cosine squared and sine squared, no good. This one has cosine squared. I'm trying to compute sine, but guess what? I do have an identity that just has some sine of theta, and it happens to be a cosine identity, but that's okay. Um, so I'm going to use this identity just because it's the only one that only has a sine squared in it. Okay, going back. Where is she? So I have that identity right here. Now what I'm going to do is be pretty sneaky. I'm going to let 22.5 be my x and my 2x be 45. So it's a true statement here that cosine of 45 is going to equal 1 minus 2 sine squared of 22.5 degrees. Now that's a true statement. Sure, wonderful. Okay, so what can I do? Well, why don't I take that sine of 22.5 and solve for it? So I'm just going to use some algebra and solve for it, because I know that cosine of 45 is equal to square root of 2 over 2. So I really have cosine, root 2 over 2 is 1 minus 2 uh, sine squared 22.5. Boom. Uh, let's see. Why don't I add 2 sine squared of 22.5 to both sides, and I'll take away root 2 over 2 from both sides. So then I'll get 2 sine squared of 22.5 is equal to 1 minus root 2 over 2. Then I'm going to divide that by 2. We need some more space here. And again, we're about to, you're going to have an identity that does this for you, so, so you don't need to worry necessarily about all the algebra steps. So divide that by 2. When you do that over here, it becomes 1 half minus root 2 over 4, just to keep our complex fractions down a little bit more. Um, and then I need to take the square root of both sides. So then I will have the sine of 22.5, whatever that is, is going to equal the positive or negative square root of, uh, I'm actually going to bring, I'll write it like this, 1 half minus square root of 2 over 4. And at that point, I think it'd be fair to stop. No, I do need to do a little check. Um, I wrote plus or minus because I took that square root, and you, you should always write you know plus or minus when you take a square root. But 
if I'm evaluating a sine value, like if I go to my calculator, I don't actually get two numbers. So you're not allowed to give me two numbers here and say, oh, I don't know, Mr. Eck, which one is it? That's pretty silly. Um, let's check sine 22.5. 22.5 is in quadrant one, right? This is what I'm supposed to compute. So this value must be positive. So I wrote plus or minus, but now I'm going to delete it and write positive uh, one half minus root two over four. And that's a little subtlety with the signage. Man, that was pretty cool. So it turns out that you can use the double angle formulas, do a little switcheroo, and also uh, they become something called the half angle formulas. Now, uh, those are a little trickier to, to work with. There is now a question about sine and quadrant, but they're pretty nice. And what we're going to do next is prove those identities as identities so that we don't have to do this whole process for every single angle. We're just going to get a single identity that looks more like the end result that we can plug values directly into. I think for the length of this video, I'm going to uh, only derive the half angle formula for cosine. And then I will state the other ones, but the proof works almost identically. The algebra is a little different, um, but we did, a, we did a sign just in the example above. So now I'm going to switch to cosine. Uh, so what I'm going to start with is the double angle identity for cosine of 2x. And I'm choosing the of the three options. Remember, there's three choices whenever you do this, three. I'm choosing the one that has a cosine x isolated in there. Then I'm going to do this cool little switcheroo. And it's... And I'm going to write this out, 2 cosine squared, blah, blah, minus 1. Instead of writing x and 2x, I'm going to write x and x over 2. Basically changing the subject and object of my sentence or my equation. And then what I'm going to do is take this value, x over 2, which is what I'm trying to find in a half angle formula, and solve for it. So do you, you just, you know... Pause for a second and, and see if you makes that switch makes sense to you, that we're switching x and 2x for uh, a new x and an x over 2. And like we're using x in the same case, but they are uh, just like a different labeling of the relationship. Okay, so let's solve. So I would get cosine of x plus 1 equals 2 cosine squared of x over 2. I'm trying to be really clear with my parentheses to separate what's inside of the argument of cosine and what's outside of the argument of cosine. Uh, that's something really important when we're dealing with these double and half angles. So you either need some neat handwriting or you need a lot of parentheses. Highly recommended or you're going to uh, mess something up. Okay, I need to divide all sides by 2. I'm also, uh, well, I'll leave it like this. Cosine of x plus 1 divided by 2, and that's going to equal uh, cosine squared of x over 2. Okay, I'm almost done, but I have to deal with this cosine squared. So to deal with that, I am going to take the square root of both sides. On this side, the roots will reduce out. On this side, uh, I'm allowed to take the root, and I'm going to write in a different color, plus or minus but question mark. And uh, I'll explain the question mark in a little bit, but just when I'm writing a root, I should think about the plus or minus. But then I will have a way of choosing which of those two plus or minus I want. And let me uh, restate the identity then. So the square root, often you'll see it in your book written as one plus cosine of x all over two. It's the same thing. They put the cosine last so they can avoid those parentheses. That's it. That's all is equal to cosine of half x, or x over 2. And again, we'll say plus or minus question mark. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But that's the derivation of the half angle formula for cosine. Okay, now I've gone to get uh, from your textbook the another copy of the half angle formulas. We just derived the half angle formula for cosine. Okay, they use alpha instead of x. It's the same thing. Um, you know, 1 plus cosine of alpha over 2. We explored earlier the half angle formula for sine. It is um, sine of alpha over 2 is equal to the square root 
of 1 minus cosine alpha over 2. So again, notice there's a lot of structural similarity. Uh, you have a 1, you have a dividing by 2, you have a, and really the main difference is just are you adding or are you subtracting inside? So again, when you're doing these problems, just make sure you're using the correct identity. They're not hard to use, really. You just have to make sure you're using the right one. And then um, there is also this question about the plus or minus that I'll address. Notice that question is only really applicable for sine and cosine for tangent. And again, we're not really covering tangent. Uh, and we're not going to go through the proof of it because it's really uh, doesn't show up a lot. But if you have to do a tangent of alpha over 2, just plug into one of these three identities and um, you know this is probably the the ugliest one but a little bit of like work with conjugates I think this is some conjugate action can simplify this into either of these two and notice that those don't have a plus or minus so those are actually gonna be better choices um, when you're doing tangents is to use one of those two now again I think it's more important for now to just focus on sines and cosines uh, and not even worry about the tangent ones but if it comes up there's a formula Write it down. Um, you don't need to memorize those, even in, in a regular class. Um, if we weren't teaching online right now, I would not ask you to memorize the half angle formulas. I would ask you to memorize the double angle formulas, but not the half angle. I think those are picky enough that if as long as you know they're there, you can go look them up. Okay, so I've been hinting at this, but now let's talk about it. What in the world are you supposed to do with a plus or minus? So let's be clear. You may not leave your final answer with a plus or minus here. It is not legal to leave this. You must choose one of the plus or minus. Why do you have to choose one? Well, because I, in a problem like this, I've given you a command, right? Think about this work as a command. And I'm saying to you, the reader, or to you, the, the solver of this problem, find the sine of, of, you know, theta over 2, whatever that is. If I go to my calculator and I type in sine of blah, 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 am I going to get two answers? Am I going to get a plus or minus? No, absolutely not. I'm only going to get a single number. So if you're coming in with your answer and you say, oh, Mr. Rick, it's positive or negative, I'm going to say no, the problem's not solved. So how do you choose? If you have to choose, how do you do it? Well, you're going to look at two things. You're going to look first at what quadrant is alpha over 2 in. And then the second thing you're going to look at is what trig ratio am I commanded to find. So if I'm commanding you to find sine, remember that sine of x is the y coordinate, so it's positive in the quadrants 1 and 2, and negative in quadrants 3 and 4. So if, if alpha over 2 was in quadrant 3, I would choose the negative answer. And I would just write negative. But if alpha over 2 was in quadrant 2 or 1, I would choose the positive answer and only write that. For cosine, cosine is positive in quadrants 1 and 4 and negative in quadrants 2 and 3. So if alpha over 2 was in quadrant 2 and I was evaluating cosine, I would choose the negative answer. And for tangent, we don't actually need it for tangent of x because we have these identities that without a plus or minus. So in these identities, the plus minus is taken care of with the cosine and sine. Like those will have the correct signage already. Um, but if I needed to think about tangent, it's positive, negative, positive, and negative. So I could use that as well. That's how I'm going to check. Uh, now this it makes more sense when you do an example. So let's do one of those now. But I'm going to come back to this idea that I need to look at two things. What quadrant is my angle in? Not the, not, by the way, angle alpha. That's where people get confused. They can understand what quadrant alpha is in, but I'm not asking you to find the sine or cosine of alpha. I'm asking you about alpha over 2. So you have to think about the new quadrant, and then you have to think about what trig ratio we're looking at. All right, so let's do some examples. Okay, so here's a problem like you might see in your textbook. and In fact, this is directly from your textbook. Uh, they tell you the tangent of alpha is 8 over 15. We'll use that in a second. 
And they also tell us that alpha is in uh, 180 to 270 range. So that's uh, technically quadrant three. But I actually like thinking about this as an inequality. They've done in degrees. You can, of course, do this in radians. I think our next example is in radians. And then they're asking us to solve for the sine of alpha over two, the cosine of alpha over two, and the tangent of alpha over two. I don't even need an identity to tell you which of these will be positive or negative. So that's what I want to approach first. I'm going to start with this inequality right here. If this is the inequality that tells you where alpha is, well, alpha over two must be between half of those values. So half of 180 is 90, and half of 270 is 135 degrees. Which means alpha over 2 is in quadrant 2. Right? And it doesn't really matter about this as being 135. It just matters which quadrant the angle is now in. Knowing that, that my alpha over 2 is in quadrant 2, I'm now able to say that sine of alpha over 2 is going to be positive. Guaranteed it's going to be positive cosine of alpha over 2 is going to be negative, and tangent of alpha over 2, I won't need it because I'm going to use the other identity, but it should also come out as a negative number. So for the sine and cosine, when I have to choose the plus or minus, that's what I'm going to choose. I don't even have to need the identity in front of me. Now let's go ahead and compute these. Uh, so if I'm looking at tangent of alpha, let's go uh, peek at the identities. For each of these half angle formulas, ooh, where did I put them? There they are. For each of the half angle formulas, you need to know cosine of alpha, and for the tangent one, I also need to know sine of alpha. What have they given me? Well, they've given me tangent of alpha. So I actually need to find the cosine alpha and sine of alpha first. Uh, let me make a sketch over here. So alpha, that angle, is in quadrant three. And the tangent of alpha, opposite, is 8. Adjacent is 15. Technically, those are both negative because of quadrant 3. I know the hypotenuse is 17. That's a Pythagorean triple. You can check my work on it if you want to. Um, but that's an 8, 15, and 17 triangle. So then I know that cosine of alpha is going to be negative 15 over 17 and sine of alpha is going to be negative 8 over 17. And these are the pieces that I'm going to need when I set up my identities for alpha over 2. Okay, so that's kind of all my prep work. I've got my identities, I understand my quadrants, I've got my cosine and sine values ready set out, now let's plug some stuff in. So I know that the sine of alpha over 2 from the identity is going to be the square root of 1 minus the cosine of alpha over 2. I need to put a plus or minus on it or decide which is plus or which is minus. I'm going to select plus because of the work we what we said about quadrants. Okay, so then this is going to be the square root of 1 minus cosine of alpha. 1 minus negative 15 over 17. All over 2. Make my root a little larger. Okay. Uh, now we've done the hard work, let's just simplify. So this is going to be uh, 1, so this is 17 seventeenths plus 15 seventeenths all over 2. That's going to equal the square root of 17 plus 15 is 32. And it'd be over 17 over 2, so that's going to be over 34. And that's going to then reduce to the square root of uh, 16 over 17, or it should. And we could reduce this further. I'm actually just going to leave this happily here. I think that's fine. Uh, you could get a decimal equivalent if you wanted to as well. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and do the cosine value. So for cosine of alpha over 2, identity says that that's going to equal the square root 
of 1 plus cosine alpha all over 2. And additionally, because it's a cosine of a quadrant 2 angle, I need to say that that's a negative square root. Um, I've chosen negative, and we talked about y earlier. Okay, let's substitute the values in. So it's going to be the negative square root of 1 uh, plus, but it's negative, so I'm just going to write as minus 15 over 17 all over 2. So that's going to be the negative square root of uh, 2 seventeenths all over 2, which should equal the negative square root of 2 thirty-fours, which I guess should equal the negative square root of 1 17th. And again, uh, you could take that and rationalize it. I'm not going to because I don't want to, and the problem is already solved. To find the tangent value, um, I could use any of these three identities. In fact, uh, you know, none of them would be that bad. I'm going to use uh, the last one uh, because I've already computed some of these values. So I know this is going to equal sine alpha over 1 plus cosine alpha. And I actually just did 1 plus cosine alpha and saw that it was 2 over 17. So I know that this will simplify to negative 8 over 17 over 2 over 17. And again, you could compute that fresh if you wanted to. I'm just using the example that I had because I've already done all that work. Uh, and that's going to simplify to negative 8 over 2, which is going to simplify to negative 4. Now notice I didn't have to select a plus or minus here. I just got that out of the sine and cosine. However, if I were selecting a plus or minus, my work at the start indicated that I should have gotten a negative already because of the angle alpha over 2 is in quadrant 2 and tangent being negative in that quadrant. Okay, uh, well that's an example. I know it's, it's kind of a page worth of work. These things can be pretty tedious. I think we've only asked you to do one or two of them. Um, and most of the tedium really is in the, in the fractions more than anything. I think we're going to do one more before we call it a day. All right, so we're given some information here. Uh, we know the secant al of alpha is negative 3. And we know that alpha, the angle, is between pi over 2 and pi. First thing I want to do is think about what quadrant alpha over 2 would be in. Well, if alpha is in uh, that range, then alpha over 2 would need to be between pi over 4 and pi over 2. Makes sense. I'm taking the boundaries on alpha, what I know about it, and dividing all those boundaries by 2 because I'm also dividing the angle by 2. Well, that matches with quadrant 1. And in quadrant 1, sine is positive, cosine is positive, and tangent is positive. When I compute these answers, then, I'm going to select the positive number under the root, or I'm only going to write the positive on the root. If you're doing this, by the way, for, uh, for me on a test or quiz or something, I do need to see some justification. Like, this would be enough. Uh, right here, you don't have to, to write me a, an essay, but I need to see that you've thought about the angles. Uh, sometimes folks will just write the square root, they won't write anything out there, and they're basically, you know, it's clear they're just taking a guess. I know. So I need to see that argument um, if you were writing this out for a teacher that was kind of grading you uh, question by question. All right, so uh, what else do I know? Well, I know that the secant of alpha is uh, negative 3, so secant is 1 over cosine. So what that means is that the cosine of alpha is negative one-third. That's probably the best way to think about it. Okay, so I'm going to give myself some space here, and we're going to sketch uh, out our angles. I'm given that alpha is in quadrant uh, 2. That is pi over 2 to pi. Cosine is negative 1 over 3, so that's adjacent over hypotenuse. Uh, the negative has to be on the adjacent because it's not on the hypotenuse. Let me solve for this. Uh, this is going to end up being square root of 8 because it is the square root of 9 minus 1, 3 squared minus 1 squared, which 
probably will simplify to two root two. I think that'll be a, a nice thing. Actually, the two root two is very nice in most of these expressions. Then I need to know cosine of alpha. Well, I already wrote that cosine of alpha is negative one third. And I need to know sine of alpha to do the tangent one. That's going to be um, opposite over hypotenuse, so two root two over three. And that's going to be kind of annoying, but I'll only really use it when I do the tangent value. And actually, now that I think about it, I might just avoid using the sine entirely by uh, using the first identity for tangent. So that way I can avoid all square roots. All right, that was a little digression. Let's do the sine of alpha over two. The identity tells me that it's the square root of one minus cosine alpha all over two, selecting positive because I'm in quad alpha over two is in quadrant one. So that's the square root of one minus negative one third over two. That's the square root of four thirds over two, which is the square root of four sixths, which is the square root of two thirds. And at that point, I think you could leave it. You could, of course, uh, rationalize this or do some more work with it, but I would just leave it as it is. Uh, select positive because alpha over two is in quadrant one. Next, cosine. So cosine is from the identity equal to the square root of one uh, plus cosine alpha over two. So that's going to be the square root. Again, selecting the positive root because uh, alpha over two is in quadrant one of one minus one third over two. That's going to be the square root of two thirds over two, which is going to end up being the square root of, check this fraction math, one third. Uh, and then that's simplified fully and I'll leave it. You could again rationalize it, but I'm not going to. Two thirds divided by two is one third, right? You don't have to do a, a weird flip and multiply to, to know that. All right, and tangent. I'm gonna use this identity right here because I've already decided on the sign positive. I, like I did that work and this is gonna be a lot easier. So this is gonna be the square root of one minus cosine alpha over one plus cosine alpha. Okay. Well, I already know what one minus cosine alpha is because I did it over here and it was four thirds. And I already know one plus cosine alpha because I did it over here and it was two thirds. So this is really just saying do four thirds divided by two thirds, which is gonna be the square root of four over two, which is going to equal the square root of two selecting here the positive because alpha over two is in quadrant one. So we have positive two, root two thirds, positive root one third, and positive root two for the three trig values. Uh, and as a special treat for sticking through this video to the end, I thought we would verify an identity that uses these, uh, these other half angle formulas as well, because why not? You know, we can. Uh, so, it looks like here that I see, the, the one thing I see right away is a theta over two and a cosine. So I immediately see that I'm doing this identity. I also see the cosine squared. Nice thing with these theta over two identities, they almost always have a squared in it. When I take this and square it, the square root's gonna immediately cancel and all that garbage with the plus or minus is also going to immediately cancel. So that's gonna be my first move is to say that this is equal to one plus cosine, oh, we're back to thetas now, over two. Okay, now I think what I'm gonna work with is the uh, right-hand side. So that's gonna equal the right-hand side, uh, secant of theta over two secant theta, plus one over two secant theta. Again, just splitting up the fraction over the plus sign. All right, well then this is gonna be one half, Right, secant over secant is one half. And one over two secant, that's gonna be the same as one over two cosine theta. Right, like right, the secant theta can come to the top and become a cosine. Well then that's gonna be the same as one plus cosine of theta all over two. And look at that, the identity is verified in about four steps. 
So again, you know, verifying these identities is mostly not that tricky because the, the formulas themselves are messy. So the algebra becomes difficult, but they're not going to write something that takes 20 steps here. They're just trying to kind of test you. Are you using the formulas right? Are you plugging things in? Are you being careful? And with your identities, of course, you know, it's not just your answer. We all know what the answer is. They told us the answer. It's your organized steps. All right, folks. I want to thank you for sticking with me to the very end. I know this was a long one. That's 40 minutes of half and double angle formulas. This is the thing in uh, section five that students always struggle with. And that's why I've made this video be so long, but I'm glad you're still here. Um, I'm going to uh, close out and please, you know, email me your questions, post them in the comments. Let me know how else I can help you with this. Uh, and until then, have a nice day.